Hey guys, so I'm Manesh, and uh, so let's get started with the, the next presentation. And so this one is called the Reach Profiler. I'm going to talk about an idea which enables retention failure profiling, which is actually figuring out where those retention failures that occur are located inside the memory. Okay, so I'm going to start with a quick overview of this talk. Right, so first I'm going to start off with the motivation. Which, um, so the problem here is that DRM refresh is actually a significant impediment to DRM scaling especially in terms of energy, but also in terms of the performance overhead that we get. So the problem that we're focusing on in this work is that DRM retention failure profiling is actually quite hard. And this occurs for a number of different reasons, but they essentially result in the fact that different cells change their retention time dynamically. And uh, it turns out that current profiling methodologies are either unreliable or they're just too slow. And so in this work, we have two major goals. First, we want to thoroughly analyze the different trade-offs surrounding retention failure profiling. And second, we want to develop a fast and reliable profiling mechanism. So we make two key contributions here. First, we perform the first detailed characterization of a whole bunch of LPDDR4 DRAM devices. And second, we use what we learn from the characterization study to propose the REACH profiler, which proposes profiling at a longer refresh interval and or at a higher temperature where failures are most likely to occur and therefore are most like, most like e are easiest to find. Excuse me, easiest to find. So through our evaluations, we find that the reach profiler actually improves profiling performance significantly, and it enables operating at longer refresh intervals that previously have been unreasonable due to the profiling overhead. So I'm going to start off with some quick background on DRM refresh, and Hassan talked a little bit about that earlier, so I'm going to go through it kind of quickly. But then I'll go on to talk about the challenges surrounding retention failure profiling and what people do today to solve this problem. Then I'm going to talk about some of the characterization studies we did, and then I'm going to talk about how we use what we learned from those studies to propose the REACH profiling mechanism, and finally end on some evaluations of the mechanism that we propose. So fundamentally, DRAM stores charge in leaky capacitors, uh, encodes data using leaky capacitors. And so here's a simple diagram of what a DRAM cell looks like. So here we show a capacitor shown in red where data is encoded as either a one or a zero depending on whether the capacitor is charged or discharged. And we have an access transistor that's used to write to or read from the cell. There are a number of charge leakage paths here by which charge can actually enter or exit the capacitor. And the key takeaway from this is that the stored data in the capacitor can actually be corrupted if too much charge leaks. And this is the same thing as saying if the capacitor voltage degrades too far. And uh, again, this is kind of what Hassan talked about in the soft MC presentation. So here's a quick diagram of what this might look like in terms of capacitor voltage, which is shown on the y-axis and a time on the x-axis. So here we see that the capacitor starts out fully charged and over time the capacitor voltage drops. And this uh, follows a roughly exponential characteristic. So we can define a point called Vmin above which we can tell what data is originally stored in the cell. And so we call this a retention success because it's easy for us to tell what was there. However, as soon as the capacitor voltage drops below this line, we consider this a retention failure because after that point, we can no longer reliably determine what data was originally stored in the cell. Furthermore, we can define a time called the retention time, which is how much time elapses before this retention failure may occur. And this is the same thing as saying how long we can tell what data was originally encoded in the cell, right? Okay. So we have to keep in mind that DRAM is much more than just one cell though, right? So DRAM is composed of hundreds of billions of cells. And for example, an eight gigabyte DRAM module uh, contains about 64 billion cells. And we have to make sure that not a single one of these experiences a retention failure. And to this end, we use a process called DRAM refresh, which periodically restores the charge in every single one of these cells. And so what this means for us is that every single cell is restored every refresh interval. And for current devices, that operates at every 64 milliseconds. And as you can imagine, this process results in significant system performance and energy degradation. So uh, here's some data taken from our evaluations just to demonstrate how costly this process is. So on the y-axis, we show average system performance overhead. And on the x-axis, we show various different DRAM chip sizes ranging from 8, 16, 32, and 64 gigabits. So we see that this performance overhead is very significant, especially for larger chip sizes such as 64 gigabits that we might be likely to see going forward into the future. And so this is a big problem for us. So it actually turns out that we don't necessarily need to pay this penalty all the time because most cells don't actually fail when we operate with a longer refresh interval. And so here's some data that we took from our characterization studies. On the y-axis, we show the number of failing cells that we, uh, that we observe at 45 degrees Celsius. 
And on the x-axis, we show various refresh intervals, ranging from the default of 64 milliseconds all the way to something huge like 8 seconds. If we focus on the small region where we increase the refresh interval just slightly, we find that there's very few failures that we actually have to deal with. And so in this particular example, we have about 100 failures going from 64 milliseconds to all the way to one second. And this is not very many failures at all, considering that this is just 100 cells out of the billions and billions of cells that make up the entire DRAM device. So this fact has not been lost on researchers in the community. And there are many prior works that exist to handle these few failures. And these works propose different mechanisms to allow reliable operation in the presence of just a few failing cells. And this list is by no means exhaustive. The problem here, though, is that all of these works assume that they can perfectly identify the set of cells that they need to handle with their different mechanisms. And this means that we need a fast and reliable profiling mechanism in order to find these cells so that we can later manage them with those mechanisms. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges surrounding retention failure profiling and talk about why it's actually so difficult to have such a fast and reliable mechanism. So here's a simplified diagram of what a DRAM refresh operation might look like. So again, we show this 2D array of cells, which are shown in green, and we have a refresh counter, which will count down the time until the next refresh operation. So if we start the clock, um, we see that the, cell, the charge in each of these cells degrades, but every 64 milliseconds, the charge is fully restored. Now, we have to note that this is a very idealized depiction of the refresh process, because in this diagram, every single cell has the exact same retention time. And if this was actually the case, this would mean that every cell uses the same refresh interval, and there's nothing really for us to do by profiling because every cell is identical. Unfortunately, it turns out that real DRAM cells have significant variation in retention times. And so let's look at some of the reasons why this might be. So here we're going to enumerate three different sources of retention time variation in cells. And so the first is uh, the cell retention time varies due to, process manu uh, due to process variation because during manufacturing there's a lot of variation among individual cells. And second, the retention time of a cell actually depends on environmental conditions such as voltage and temperature. And Hassan touched on that before, that we can characterize that sort of thing using the SoftMC infrastructure. But what this means is that different cells have different retention times that actually change as time goes on. Another significant contributor is this effect called data pattern dependence, which means that the retention time of a cell actually changes depending on what data you write into the DRAM, into the surrounding cells, and into the cell itself. And for example, if you programmed a DRAM module with all ones, you would expect to see different retention times than if you programmed the exact same module with all zeros. A third big contributor is this effect called variable retention time. And this, actually, this effect means that the retention time of a given cell actually changes randomly over time. And more importantly, it changes unpredictably. And this occurs due to a combination of different circuit effects. And prior work has actually shown that because of this variable retention time effect, it's actually necessary to use error correction codes in our DRAM memories, because these unpredictable changes might occur at any point in time, and you'll have to deal with them as they come. OK, so now let's take a look at what a more realistic picture of the DRAM refresh operation looks like. So here we show the same 2D array of cells, but this time we show more, a, real, a more realistic depiction of the distribution of retention times. So here we have some cells shown in green, which have a long retention time, and other cells ranging to the red, which have a very short retention time. And as we start the clock here, we see that the cells with a short retention time actually degrade much further than the cells with a long retention time. And what this means is that the cells with a short retention time actually require a short refresh interval. Whereas the cells with a long, a long retention time can actually handle operation at a longer refresh interval. So now let's take a look at what happens if we increase the refresh interval for all of these cells. So here, we're going to extend the refresh interval from the default of 64 milliseconds and double it to 128 milliseconds. And as we start the clock in this picture, we see that the, vo the voltage in all these cells degrades. And the cells that require a short refresh interval actually degrade so far that we experience retention failures. And so the problem we want to solve in this work is that how can we quickly and reliably determine the exact failing cells that fail at an increased refresh interval that we want to run at? Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some of the current approaches that people use for retention failure profiling. So the first approach that we want to talk about is called ECC scrubbing. And um, so the key idea here is to leverage error correction codes that are already built into the memory or the memory controller by periodically accessing every single ECC word in the memory device. And every time we come across a failure, we log the location of that failure. This is effectively a form of profiling. So the pros of this approach are that it's very simple, because it just consists of read accesses to all of the different DRAM locations. And for this reason, it's rather low overhead. 
because DRAM is actually still uh, available for regular operation while you're performing the ECC scrub operation. However, on the downside, it's actually unreliable because it won't account for any changes in retention time that occurred due to data pattern changes. And this can potentially allow us to miss any failures that occur between scrub operations. The second approach that we consider is what we call brute force profiling. And the idea here is that for n different data patterns that you want to test over a number of different testing rounds, you first write the given data pattern to DRAM, you wait for the refresh interval that you're interested in operating at, and then you check for errors. And this was very similar to the approach that um, we used for retention time testing in the SoftMC talk before. So the pros of this approach are that it's much more reliable because you're finding a higher percentage of all the possible failures by using many different data patterns over many different testing rounds. But on the downside, it's very slow because many different testing rounds are required to achieve high reliability. And it's also rather high overhead because when you're doing this sort of profiling, DRAM is unavailable for quite a long amount of time. And so this is not acceptable. And so what we want to do is we want to study the different profiling trade-offs and we want to use what we get from that to develop a fast and reliable profiling mechanism. Okay, so are there any questions about this so far? So now I'm going to talk about some of the characterization studies that we did. And um, so we developed a testing infrastructure that's capable of testing a whole bunch of LPDDR4 DRAM devices. So each chip is four gigabits in size, and we have chips from across three major DRAM manufacturers. And in order to control any sort of temperature variation, we do all of our testing in a thermally controlled testing chamber. And we can vary the ambient temperature range a little bit, and we have a pretty good tolerance of 0.25 degrees Celsius. Uh, furthermore, we have a localized heating source that allows us to maintain DRAM temperature at 15 C above the ambient, and this just smooths out any local fluctuations that we might have. So we do a whole bunch of studies with this infrastructure, and the first three, temperature, data pattern dependence, and retention time distributions, actually show results that are very similar to prior work in DDR3 devices, and uh, they're sort of what you'd expect. And so in this talk, we're going to focus on variable retention time and individual cell characterization, which presents some interesting data and from which we can gain interesting conclusions to motivate our mechanism. So here's some data that was taken from a representative chip uh, from one specific vendor at a fixed refresh interval of 2048 milliseconds. Right? So on the y-axis, we show the number of new failing cells that we discover over time. And on the x-axis, we show a span of about a week. And so what we find is that we can sort of break this up into two different regimes. In the first regime, in about the first half day of testing, we continuously detect a whole bunch of new failing cells. But after that, we also continue to detect a sort of steady state amount of cells over time. And what this means is that uh, essentially we're seeing a whole bunch of failures that we find first and some new cells that keep popping up. And so we have to attribute this to the variable retention time effect because at different points in time, different cells are moving in and out of the 2048 millisecond guard band. And so we're detecting those cells as we go on. And so this essentially means that the set of failing cells that we need to deal with by profiling is changing over time. And it's not, in, it's not good enough to just do one round of profiling and say, this is everything. And so we draw two major conclusions from this. First, we say that error correction codes are necessary. And second, we say that online profiling is necessary because the set of failures keeps changing over time. Right. The second analysis that we do deals with looking at a cell individually. And so on the y-axis here, we show the probability of a single cell failing from a read access. On the x-axis, we show various different refresh intervals ranging from zero to six seconds. And so this is a cartoon of what an idealized cell might look like. Right. And so we'll say this cell has a retention time of three seconds because lower than three seconds, it has no probability of failure whatsoever. But as soon as you go above three seconds, the failure of probability is at 100%, right? And so we can only read data correctly if we're refreshing at least every three seconds. Um, from our experimental evaluations, we actually find that a real cell looks something more like the blue curve depicted here, and it actually follows a normal CDF. And here we can say that the mean of this distribution is at three seconds. And so a takeaway from this is even below this thing that we might call the retention time at the mean, we have a non-zero probability of a failure, right? So refreshing every three seconds is not a guarantee that this cell will always behave correctly. Okay, so now let's take a look at what some real data looks like from taken from an actual device. And so here we're showing the failure probability of a single cell taken from a representative device. And this is the same plot as before, except now the refresh interval on the x-axis has been restricted to a, a range that we find interesting. And so this is data taken from uh, one cell, and we do this by taking 16 trials at each of the x-axis point and determining how many times it fails out of that. 
And so for this point, for example, this particular cell failed nine times, and so we assign it a probability of failure. Right? So here we show eight different cells that, you know, just eight different cells that we want to take a look at. And it's actually a little easier to think about this if we apply their normal distribution fits. So, okay, so now we have these eight different cells. So suppose we're interested in operating at a refresh interval of 1.7 seconds, right? So at this regime, we'll find that there are six cells that are failing. And the problem here is that these two cells at the bottom are actually quite hard to find because they have a low probability of failure. And so you'll require many rounds of testing in order to discover them reliably. If instead we profile an increased refresh interval of say 1.9 seconds, then we'll, all these six cells become rather easy to find because their probability of failure is much higher. Uh, on the downside, we'll identify some extra failures that don't occur at the conditions we're interested in operating at, and these are basically false positives from our profiling mechanism. Right? So this leads us into the profiling mechanism that we're proposing. And the key idea of that is that any cell is more likely to fail at a longer refresh interval and or a higher temperature, and we want to take advantage of this. Okay. Are there any questions about that? So we proposed reach profiling, right? And so, as I said, the key idea is that we're taking advantage of the fact that cells are more likely to fail at increased temperature, increased refresh interval. So if on this quick uh, depiction on the y-axis we have temperature and the x-axis we have refresh interval, if we choose an operating point that we're interested in, we should actually profile something that's more aggressive in either one or both of these two dimensions. And so the pros of this approach are that it's fast and it's reliable because we're searching for cells where they are most likely to fail, right? And so they're very easy to discover. But on the downside, we have to deal with some false positives. And this means that the profiler might identify some cells to be failing at the profiling conditions, but we'll never see them actually fail under actual runtime operation. Okay. So as it stands, reach profiling, we've proposed it as a general methodology for finding failures. And if we want to turn it into an actual microarchitectural implementation, we have to answer a few questions. And so we identify three key questions that we want to, uh, we want to answer. So first, what are the actual desirable profiling conditions we want to profile at? Um, how often should the system be running this profiling operation? And what information do we actually need to give to the profiler in order to enable this whole process? And so we're going to look at these one by one. And so in order to do an analysis of this, we want to look at the entire trade-off space surrounding retention failure profiling. Uh, we identify three key profiling metrics that any retention failure profiling mechanism must uh, take a look at. So the first is runtime, which is uh, quite easily how long profiling actually takes. The second is coverage, which is the proportion of all possible failures that can be discovered by a profiling mechanism. And the third is the false positive rate, which represents the number of cells that are identified to be failing at profiling conditions, but not at operating conditions. Okay. So we use these three metrics to explore all sorts of different profiling conditions um, for different temperatures, different refresh intervals, and we use what we learn from that to uh, sort of answer these three key questions we talked about before. So the first of those questions was, what are the desirable profiling conditions we want to operate at? And so we actually find that there are very similar trends across both different chips and different vendors. And um, for an example point, uh, in order to maintain 99% coverage of the set of failing cells at given conditions we're interested, in, uh, we're interested in operating at, we find that by reach profiling at uh, plus 250 milliseconds relative to what we want to operate at, we can get a 2.5x speed up on average. And this comes at a cost of 50% false positive rate. And we can actually push the speed up much higher by increasing the reach conditions that we're, uh, that we're profiling at, but this comes at the cost of an increasing false positive rate. And so one thing to keep in mind is that these numbers look rather high, and we'll talk about why that may or may not actually be the case uh, in a few slides. But so this is just some sample points just to give you an idea of what the space looks like. Uh, we actually have a very exhaustive analysis of this in the paper, and so if you're interested in that, you can go take a look at it, and it's there in a lot more detail. Okay. The second question we want to answer is how often should we actually run this profiling mechanism? And we estimate how this would be using a probabilistic model. And we use the empirical data that we gather from our characterization studies and plug it into the model to get some sort of representation of what this might be. And again, the details of this model are rather specific, and so they're contained in the paper if you're interested in looking at it. But just for an example here, to put things into perspective, uh, for a specific configuration with the assumptions listed here, we find that we need to reprofile every 2.3 days. And this applies for a 2 gigabyte DRAM chip with error correction capability and some of the assumptions listed here. And again, this is just one point for you to um, you know, sort of put into perspective, but we have a whole analysis of all sorts of different conditions in the paper. And these are actually parameters that you can trade off depending on what you want. Okay. 
So the third question we want to answer is what are the, what's the information that we actually need to give to the profiler in order to make all these decisions? And so there's two key things. The first is we need to know the cost of handling the failures we identify because this determines how many errors we can actually mitigate, right? And so um, this goes back to the false positive rate we talked about earlier, right? So if we have a mechanism such as error correction codes, which is a sort of distributed throughout the entire device and corrects things at a very small granularity, maybe we can handle a whole bunch of failures because if they're all separate from each other, error correction codes will help us mitigate that. And therefore, if we have a whole bunch of false positives in addition to that, maybe it's not that big a deal, right? We can handle hundreds, maybe thousands of failures. Uh, on the other hand, if we have a mechanism that's very heavy handed and say it throws out an entire row every time a single failing cell is found in there, well, the cost of identify the cost of mitigating a single failure becomes rather expensive. And so there, maybe we can only handle tens of failures and a high false positive rate is unacceptable. So depending on the mitigation mechanism you choose, you really have to make these trade-offs for what you want. The second piece of information we need is some sort of empirical per chip characterization data. And we want this information so that we can intelligently you know, make good estimates about these profiling parameters for a particular device. Uh, the details of exactly what we want for this sort of uh, data are in the paper. And we can make do without it by using estimates drawn from the, the general trends that we've observed. But this would be the absolute ideal case. And if the vendor won't provide this to us, then we can either uh, make do without it or try and get it ourselves. Okay. So the last part that we're going to talk about is our end-to-end -end evaluation, which just sort of goes over the performance and power consumption of the mechanism that we're proposing relative to what prior work has proposed. And so in order to do this evaluation, we need an actual concrete mechanism. And our mechanism is called Reaper. And it's a very simple implementation of reach profiling. And it makes a number of very pessimistic assumptions to model the worst case situation. So the first bad assumption is that the whole system pauses during profiling. And this means that while profiling is occurring, no useful work is being done at all by the system. And we assume that there's some firmware in the memory controller that's executing a simple profiling routine. And at this point in time, the memory controller has exclusive access to all of DRAM. And so the system can no longer access it. A second, we assume that Reaper can only manipulate the refresh interval and not temperature. And we believe this is a reasonable assumption for devices that might be in the field, right? Because it's quite hard to control temperature uh, you know, through uh, programmatically, whereas the refresh interval potentially can be done much more easily. Okay. And so our evaluation methodology uses simulation. And so we measure performance using Ramulator, which is the same simulator that Hassan talked about earlier. And we measure energy using a simulator called DRAM Power. Uh, we model some configuration that's reasonable, you know, four core CPU with uh, eight megabyte last level cache. And we, we use um, some, a memory model that's very similar to the stuff we did our characterization with. And finally, for our workloads, we create 20 random four core benchmark mixes which are drawn from the spec CPU 2006 benchmark suite, which uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with, is a sort of industry standard suite that's used in yeah, both academia and in industry. Okay, so here's a slide that summarizes the end-to-end -end performance gain that we observe by using reach profiling. And so this is a rather complicated figure, so I'll go through it piece by piece. And so on the y-axis, we show the end-to-end -end system performance gain. And on the x-axis, we show various different refresh intervals. For every single refresh interval that we test, we show three different box plot distributions. And each one of these individual box plots represents the distribution of performance observed across our 20 different benchmark mixes. And so for each of these uh, refresh intervals, we show three box plots. And going from left to right, the purple represents the brute force profiling mechanism, which is our baseline as the previous best mechanism. The central box plot shows our mechanism, the Reaper. And the rightmost mechanism shows the ideal profiling mechanism that has no performance overhead whatsoever. And so. There's a number of things to observe on this graph. First, if we restrict ourselves to small refresh intervals, we actually see that all three box plots are very much the same. And this is because at this sort of refresh interval, we have very few failures that we need to worry about. And so we actually don't have to profile very often at all. And so there's not much overhead in any of these mechanisms. And so you can basically pick whatever you want. Um, in contrast, at very high refresh intervals, we have a lot of failures we need to handle. And so we need to reprofile often. And in some cases, we need to reprofile so often that we actually observe performance degradation. Right? So these refresh intervals are rather unreasonable to run at. Um, the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle here between 1024 and 1280 milliseconds, where here we see that the Reaper mechanism visibly outperforms the brute force, the brute force profiling mechanism um, while actually still maintaining a significant amount of the benefits that you would get from using the ideal profiling mechanism. Okay. And so this is an example of the trade-off space that we're considering. And you would use some analysis like this to determine what refresh interval is actually appropriate to operate at with your given system.
So we do some, uh, so we take some aggregate metrics across all the different things we evaluate, and we find that on average, Reaper enables some significant system performance and power improvements, right? And the second part of this is that Reaper is enabling longer refresh intervals, which previously have been unreasonable due to the overhead of uh, profiling. And in this case, specifically relative to the brute force profiling mechanism. Okay, are there any questions about this? Before I summarize the talk? Okay. So um, yeah, there's a whole bunch more analysis in the paper, and so if any of this interested you, you can go take a look at it. You know, we have a lot more detail about the characterization that we did, the characterization of the profiling trade-off space, um, our probabilistic model for tolerating failure rates, and uh, even more results about our end-to-end -end evaluations based on energy consumption and on the performance of the mechanism. Okay. So now I'm just gonna quickly summarize the presentation that I gave, right? So our motivation for this work was that DRAM refresh is a big impediment to um, scaling in the future, especially in terms of energy, but also in terms of performance. And so the specific problem that we focused on is that current retention failure profiling has either been unreliable or it's just too slow. And so we had two major goals here. First, we want to thoroughly analyze the different trade-offs surrounding retention failure profiling and use what we learned to develop a fast and reliable profiling mechanism. And to this end, we make two key contributions. First, we perform a lot of detailed characterization using LPDDR4 DRAM devices. And second, we propose the REACH profiler, which enables profiling at a longer refresh interval or a higher temperature, um, finding cells where they're most likely to fail. Um, finally, through our evaluations, we show that REACH profiling enables significant performance benefit over prior approaches to retention failure profiling. And it also enables longer refresh intervals that previously have been unreasonable due to profiling overhead. Okay. And so that's the end of my presentation, so thanks. Uh, do you guys have any questions? I can explain it in any more detail. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can take a look at the paper. And so, you know, if any of you guys are interested in research in, in the architecture field, any of these presentations we're doing today is something that, you know, you might find yourself doing one day, like going through this process, these types of mechanisms. And so it's you know, useful for you to consider. Yeah, okay, then I'm gonna hand it off to Jeremy, who's gonna give one last presentation. Okay, thanks.